Is there a writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read, writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truths, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time. And we'd love for you to join us. Hey listeners, quick correction. Last podcast, we announced we were giving a virtual talk on using podcasting to promote your author brand for the San Francisco chapter of the Women's National Book Association. And we gave the wrong date. It's happening on November 10th. That's a Thursday at noon. You can find the link on our website, www.wordstowritebypodcast.com. And now I'm super excited to interview an award-winning science fiction author, who published a writing craft book last year. I'm Charlie J. Danders, and I'm the author of Never Say You Can't Survive, How to Get Through Hard Times by Making Up Stories. So all writers spend a fair amount of time figuring out what works and what doesn't work for them when they're putting their ideas down. And I'm assuming that you're the same. What made you decide to take the stuff that you figured out what worked and didn't work for you and put it into a craft book? Yeah, so uh, a little backstory. I had been writing essays about writing for this website called io9 for a long time back in the day. I started working on io9, which is a blog about science fiction, fantasy, and futurism back in like 2008. And pretty early on, I was like, I should write some essays about writing, even though at the time nobody really cared what I thought about writing. I was just like, I'm going to do it anyway. And so I did. I kind of pushed past the imposter syndrome. And those essays became more popular than I expected. Like people were really digging them. After I left io9, I always wanted to do a craft book, you know, take some of those thoughts that I'd had about writing and put them into a craft book. And in particular, kind of talk about some stuff that had seemed to be really important to me, which was kind of finding ways to get closer to intentionality finding ways to focus your intent and stay close to it. And we actually had pitched kind of a vanilla craft book back in like 2016, 2017, that was like how to write science fiction and fantasy. And what I discovered was that there was a huge crowded market. Like it was a very saturated market for craft books generally and for craft books about science fiction and fantasy specifically. And so it was like, okay, yeah, that's not going to work. So at some point in like 2019, 2020, I had this other idea for craft book about using creative writing to get through rough times and help you survive and keep yourself whole when everything is going pear-shaped and like history is getting historical. So I ended up pitching that in early 2020 and I already had this kind of sense that, oh, 2020 might be kind of a rough year. Maybe we could <laughs> post some of this book online while I'm writing it. And then of course, 2020 ended up being a very rough year. And so that ended up being timely. So that's where the book came from. But I'd always wanted to do a craft book and it was really a matter of finding the approach that felt new and fresh that still allowed me to talk about all the things I wanted to talk about because there's still a lot in that book about intentionality and about connecting to yourself and trying to hear what story you're trying to tell because I feel like that is a crucial component of using writing to survive. But it was really about finding a concept that would work and that wasn't going to be too similar to the hundreds and hundreds of craft books that already are out there. Neat. I found the book to be both very specific in the individual chapters, but very broad in all the different things that it covered. So one thing I enjoyed about the book was the life that you imbibed into your character examples from the characters of your actual book, but also just the, you know, random, here's a writing prompt exercise, this is a character. And I was wondering when you're writing both the book itself, but also the other essays that you had written in the past, if you had kind of like a character in your head, a person who you're writing for, and what that kind of person was. Oh, man. I mean, 
You know, it's funny. I talk a lot in the book about finding an imaginary audience that you're writing to. And I definitely, I feel like I did have an imaginary audience as I was writing this book of people who are kind of aspiring writers, people who are maybe struggling to be productive, people who are maybe struggling in general, because again, it was 2020, people who needed encouragement and some advice on bringing their vision out and bringing it to the world. And there were times when I had to pull back from getting a little too, not technical, but a little too inside baseball, I guess, about the writing world, or a little too strident and angry about like, you know, this is garbage or whatever, or people shouldn't say this because this is a really hurtful thing to say. The tone that I really worked for in this book was kind of gentle and reassuring because I was kind of writing to traumatized people, but also because I wanted to be encouraging and like, you can do this. It's okay. Rather than like, ah, everything sucks, which I definitely had days where I was like, ah, everything sucks. And then I had to kind of pull back from that. And actually the thing that I decided to do posting chapters online at Tor.com and letting people read them in real time or not quite in real time. I tried to stay a few weeks ahead. That turned out to be really helpful because I got to see people's reactions to the essays in real time. It got to be more of a conversation, which I feel like is a really good thing for a book about writing. Good writing always is a conversation anyway. And I feel like in order to tap into what people really wanted from a book about writing, it was really helpful to get feedback in real time from people who were like, oh, can you say more about this? Or, oh, this was interesting. I'd love to know more about that. Or, you know, oh gosh, this didn't make any freaking sense at all. Can you clarify? And so that was helpful when it came time to revise, but also I'd be working on the next chapters of the book and I'd see, oh yeah, okay, so people are responding to this and like, this didn't hit the way I thought it would. So it was actually really helpful. I kind of accidentally stumbled on what I think is a good model for a writing advice book, which is having more of a dialogue and having more of a kind of a real time conversation. That's a great answer. It was going to be the next question I was going to ask, which was that I've noticed that a lot of books are more prescriptive. I found the quote in yours, some writers write every day, others only a few times a month. It's all about what works for you. I found your book not to be terribly prescriptive, but much more open with a lot of different ideas, but nothing that said, do it this way. A lot of times we pick up a book, uh, as writers pick up a writing craft book and say, tell me what to do in order to finally get my words out. But you chose not to tell people as much as to have this dialogue. Yeah, and that actually is a very deeply held belief of mine. When I was writing writing advice for io9, I wrote some essays about like basically if people try to tell you the rules of writing, what they're really telling you about are their own insecurities or the things that have worked for them that might work for you but also might not. And definitely when it gets to like you're not a real writer unless you do x y and z, that is just there's a lot of imposter syndrome there. There's a lot of like gatekeeping. There's a lot of really unhelpful stuff kind of embedded in that. You know, I think I wrote an essay once for io9 called What It Means When People Try to Tell You the Rules of Writing, because I really feel strongly that that's not a thing that exists and that whatever works for you, whatever is going to result in the story that you wanted to tell, that's great, do that. There's no like secret sauce, there's no formula there's no right or wrong way to do it, especially with this book where the goal was to help people to feel like they could do this and to help people feel like this is something that's going to help you get through a really tough time. It would be really, really destructive and counterproductive to be like, but you have to do it this way, but you have to follow my formula or you're not doing it right. I felt like that would be especially bad in this kind of situation. So you got a lot of feedback from both posting them online, but also the book's been out for a while. What section or uh, not as much piece of advice, but like area did people really like? What kind of feedback have you gotten specifically? People really seem to like the chapter on imposter syndrome, where I kind of talk about how imposter syndrome is garbage, but also how to deal with imposter syndrome. My advice pretty much boils down to think of yourself as being in community with other writers rather than competing with them and understand that everybody is struggling. We're all struggling. Unless you're like Stephen King or, you know, George R. R. Martin, we're all struggling in our careers. Even the people who seem like they're doing really well probably think of themselves as really struggling. Also, the chapter about anger, like where I'm like, anger is really helpful. 
you can use your anger. You can actually use it to get stuff done. And you can channel it into all sorts of other emotions that are really helpful for your writing. If you're angry, great. You can use that. I think that that was one of the more therapeutic and also really practically helpful things that I kind of came up with from what people have told me, at least. Neat. Okay, one more question, which is, how did you come about the name of the book? Where did that come from? Oh, man, I'm trying to remember. I mean, I love Curtis Mayfield. Curtis Mayfield is a freaking legend. One of his albums is called Never Say You Can't Survive, and it's a gorgeous album. It's like the title track is just heartbreakingly beautiful and amazing. I love all of his stuff. And he's been a huge inspiration to me over the years. And I was very careful to kind of like acknowledge the debt I owe to Curtis Mayfield for that title and for so much else. I wanted a title that really said, we're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. And that creativity can help you be okay. But I thought of that being the title that just felt really right, partly because of how active it is. It's about the story you tell yourself. And that's obviously the first and most important story that we ever tell as writers is the story that we tell ourselves about who we are and what we're doing. And so the story you should you tell yourself should be a story of like, I'm going to survive. I'm going to make it. Nice. Thank you so much. This has been a great interview. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for having me. This was lovely. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Words to Write By. Woohoo! What makes it special, Renee? We're going on a writing retreat. Aw, yeah! <laughs> and we're not reviewing a chapter of Bickham's book. We're just going to talk about the writing retreat. Uh, right now, we are leaving in two days, and so we are going to talk about all the exciting stuff we're going to do for it. And then for our second half of our podcast, we'll check in and talk about all the success that we've had for the podcast. Yeah. We're applying what we have learned, essentially. We've had almost a year, actually over a year now, about podcasting and reading these books and reading them very carefully. So we have all this knowledge to apply to our writing retreat. You know, I think the Bradbury stuff is really going to be applicable here about butt in chair. <laughs> So, Kim, what, what goals do you have? You know, you're like, okay, writing retreat. We're going to go somewhere else to write. What's your goal? Well, my goal always is just to get through this first draft. Um, <laughs> Are you going to try to write the entire book? No, no, I know I cannot do that. I uh, I just want to have it done. Uh, <laughs> I want to go to sleep and wake up three months later and have had me write nonstop. Um, I would like to get about 10,000 words written out. I'd like to push forward a significant chunk of chapters for an initial first draft. My goal is that I will hit a point where it is easy for me just to keep writing and just push through a huge amount, kind of like those really good days you had when you're doing NaNoWriMo where you just got a ton of stuff done. So I want to do a little mini NaNoWriMo. A mini NaNoWriMo. I like that. That's kind of what a retreat is. Isn't a NaNoWiiko. <laughs> a NaNoWiiko. <laughs> that is both awesome yet horrifying. I don't know why. But it's a great term. We're having a NaNoWiiko. <laughs> Dear I listeners. am. What do you want to do? So mine is a little bit more nebulous. I'm trying to nail down my writing voice for my chapters where I talk about myself as a child. For some reason, that has been very difficult. I'm sure my therapist has some theories, but I'm nailing it down. I'm actually getting closer and closer. And this retreat, I'm going to try and tackle those chapters. And my theory is that once I can get that voice down, it will be like the fuel for getting through those chapters. I'll know where I'm going with them. So that is my goal. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of stuff printed out and you'll just deep dive into what you've got and you won't be distracted by anything that pulls you away from it. You can really keep your brain on the work. Yes, but some of this hasn't been written. I've essentially written all the other chapters and avoided these ones. Okay, so there is going to be a lot of writing for Yes, this. there will be a lot of writing because I've, I've attempted them and the attempts I did not like. And so I'm hoping that this will be the last attempt and it will be good good it'll pass the renee style 
test. If you work on something and get part way and you put it aside for a while and you come back to a month later, you're not going to like it and you're going to be back at square one. But if you manage to get through the whole thing, you come back to it a month later because it's like done, mm -hmm. you'll move forward. Yeah. Have um, you ever done a writing retreat before, Renee? I have. I wrote about it. So, dear readers, if you would like to go to our website, under articles, you'll find an article written by me uh, about a retreat I took last year during the summer. And it was an experiment. I decided, all right, I'm going to go to the middle of nowhere Placerville, where it's like the cheapest Airbnbs I could find. It's essentially a pit stop on the way to Tahoe. It was only a couple hours, and it had a beautiful view. It was very hot. It's a, this tiny room on the side of a house on a hill. And I sat there, or I sat there. I was there for about three days. And I attempted to do my own writing retreat with Blackjack and Hookers. With Blackjack and Hookers? Don't you watch Futurama? No, I missed that one. Oh, That's it's a joke. <laughs> I'll have my own party with Blackjack and Hookers. And the, the whole episode bender just goes, with Blackjack and Hookers, like over to... I don't know. I'm a huge um, Futurama nerd, so maybe you'll just cut that out. Maybe I will and maybe I won't. <gasps> so, Kim, have you ever been on a writing retreat? Yes. So three or four years ago, I was working on a novel that never got finished. I had gotten to the point where I was a good 50,000 words in. I was, I was really struggling to keep moving forward on it. So I came up with the concept that if I left my family and went somewhere by myself, I could push through and get enough momentum to continue it on. This is a theme here, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> so I also had some of the same things I was looking for. Not a far drive, someplace isolated, someplace not that expensive. I found a place in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It was a room in a house in an isolated part of the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the house itself looked pretty good. I saw a couple places where I could do writing. The room looked nice and clean. That was only three days. So one full day of writing and then writing on either end. How'd it go? Well, while the person that owned the house was not in my face or anything like that, it felt like I was creeping around somebody else's house. It was neatly decorated. He had all these like musical instruments out and it was very tasteful and it was a really cool place. But I was very much in somebody else's space. And at one point, there was another guest that was staying there. So, like, I'd have to talk to them at the tiny room table. And I got some good work done, but it wasn't long enough and it wasn't isolated enough. Mm, I can see that. How about you? Did you get some work done? I got a lot of free writing done. Um, it was very hot. I remember when you were picking them out, I said, now make sure it has an air conditioning unit. And that cut out pretty much every single one I had bookmarked. <laughs> but it was a good thing you said so. So this one did have air conditioning, but it was like a big device and it was really loud and it wasn't very effective. But it was there. Um, I ended up watching a lot of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to admit that there. Like I had looked into some retreats, very expensive. If you ever go looking for a writing retreat somewhere, they're very expensive because you have to buy the plane ticket. Sometimes it just costs money to stay there. And so I was like, well, I can do this more cheaply. One other thing that I noticed uh, with looking online at actual writing retreats, they would like you to do sometimes readings. Like that seemed contrary. I'm like, I don't want to be bothered. Sometimes they'd make you like cook. I'm like, that is like the worst thing that could ever happen to me is being asked to cook. Like that is taking all my time away. Well, not all my time, but it's taking a lot of time away in my attention. I could do writing home. in the day and have to cook and I'd be at home. <laughs> right. <laughs> like why am I paying to cook for other people? It doesn't make any sense. Also, I'm a good baker, but I'm not a very good cook. So I thought those were problems that I could just overcome by get, doing my own retreat. So the food, yes, I, I'm not into cooking and that stayed that way. But the reading afterwards actually made sense. While I was there, I thought, oh, if I was being held accountable, I would be writing more carefully. I would be maybe putting a little more effort into the draft that I was writing. And so a lot of those free writes would have turned more into drafts. So I'm thinking for this retreat, 
at night, I would like us to have like 500 words to read to each other just so we know we have to be held accountable by the end of the day. What do you think? Yeah. The other thing I noticed is that while I want this huge block of time just to do my own stuff, I actually do need a fair amount of structure in my approach to things. If I have too much time, I end up watching Lord of the Rings. <laughs> my own personal experience, this is when I had very small children and my parents would say, you know, they don't have daycare this week. It's it's closed. Why don't you just drop them off at our house and then you guys can have the week yourself. And we drop them off like we can, we can do this and this and this and this. But then we need to have just a day to completely decompress. And then we, we try something, but like we managed to just natter away all that free time. In the end, it was critical the kids weren't in the house. That was good, but we didn't get the projects done. And I really want this retreat to get the projects done. And I think you're right. We need to have some accountability and some kind of, I mean, not structure as like, and now we're going to make the dinner or, and now we're going to do the yoga session, but structure as far as check-in times or reading at the end. I think we'll probably also do some daily podcasting. I'm thinking we can do similar to when we did our writing marathon where we just did recordings. We will do a daily check-in and I'll put those recordings together for a bonus podcast. Yeah, that was really fun. Actually, that was a really popular episode too. People really liked um, those check-ins. It's kind of like reality TV. I was actually thinking instead of putting it on just the Patreon, we might make this one available to all our listeners about a week after we get done. Ooh. And then if you like that kind of podcast, that bonus podcast, you can always check out our Patreon account. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, you, p listeners will get a taste of what a bonus podcast is. That's a good idea. Yeah. So I do have a couple other things that I want to mention. One, I'm going to have some rules for myself. And I, I hope that maybe you would too. One, no Reddit. No Reddit. No Reddit, damn it, no social media, and maybe no TV shows or anything until it's clear that we're done for the day. Oh, good. If we're done for the day, we could watch a She-Ra? Why, yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Oh, we. I definitely want to watch She-Ra, but no more Lord of the Rings, because I will just get sucked in and not, it, it's hard for me to stop, because I love that. Right. I don't have a problem with Reddit or social media, but I do like looking at news sites, and I need to figure out a way not to look at news sites. I think I will bring a novel to read when I need a break from writing. And if you see me looking at my phone intensely, you are to ask me, Kim, what are you looking at? Same for me. Make sure I'm not just not typing and just staring at the screen. So I'm not just reading stuff because <laughs> that's what I would be doing. I want to not do that for the days we're there to get the most out of it. I also just finished a class. It lasted two months and it was four hours of writing and they used the Pomodoro method. Now, traditionally the Pomodoro method is like you work for 40 minutes and then you take a 20 minute break. They did it for 50 minute work and then 10 minute break. I'm thinking I might utilize that because I kind of liked it because every time there was a 10 minute break, it was like, oh, a break. And even though I didn't think I needed it, I'd get up and walk around and then I'd come back and I'd be ready to work. The problem is I'll work for like two and a half hours and then I'm exhausted and then I'm like slipping into Reddit mode and then I'm just going through, you know, feeds and feeds and cat pictures and dumb stuff. I like that. I actually think it might be a nice way of giving us a structure, maybe not the whole of the day, but maybe picking like the mornings or something. And the cool thing about this place, one other thing we decided to do, since we're going in together, we went for a more expensive Airbnb. Dun -dun. We actually found a really beautiful one. There's a hot tub, so we could do a, a 10 minute hot tub soak nice. or something like that. It's an experiment. I've been in retreats where everything's boring and dull, beige, only can focus on the writing. And this summer, my family was in a very nice Airbnb up in Washington, and we got a couple days of rain, which is really novel for Californians. And we just chilled, and it had enough space. So I took the dining room table. One of my sons was in his room. Another son was on the couches. There was space. It was a large enough place that we all had our own space, and I actually got a lot of good writing done that weekend during the rainy sessions. 
So we were deciding to get this Airbnb. I was in that other Airbnb, like searching for Airbnbs. And it's like, this is really nice. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if having a nicer Airbnb with somebody else to be accountable to, but not somebody that's going to say, oh, let's go out for a hike or do this other stuff. Right. Because they, they know how to get you away from your work. And I, I don't want to leave my work and you don't want to leave your work. So um, what stuff are you bringing? Right. So I don't want to have to, like you said, cook meals together. And right. We might not even eat necessarily some meals together if somebody else is on a, a kick because we both actually like very different kinds of food. Exactly. And I think we're each going to bring our own sets of food. Maybe if, if you make cinnamon rolls, that might be it. I might make some cinnamon rolls just for fun. But, like, we each have enough food to get ourselves by. I also think maybe we might want to go out to eat once or twice. There's a yeah. place down the way. We could schedule something maybe at the end of the day. I am going to bring my coffee and tea stuff. I have a particular schedule for the day where I start off the day with tea, and then I rebrew the pot, which could be bad if it was cheap tea, but I have nice expensive tea, so it's really good for rebrewing, but there's no more caffeine. And then usually between noon and two is when I need actual coffee. I'm going to bring my whole setup for that. Right. You're going to bring your kettle so I can use it? Yeah. I have pour over coffee, and I know that sounds fancy, but my favorite coffee is the $5 stuff at Trader Joe's. I used to be a coffee snob, and then the older I got, the more I just wanted consistent flavor. <laughs> um, also, coffee got too fancy for me. So uh, I have my regular coffee, I have my little pour over kit, and that's what I'm going to be using. That sounds like a pretty good selection for, for food. For... Should we talk about books? Uh, yeah, so what materials are you bringing for? So I get a lot of inspiration from reading. I mean, obviously everybody does, but I tend to read before I write because I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you ever get the experience where you're reading something you really enjoy, but then you think, God, I could do that too. Or you get this feeling of being launched from your reading to your writing. And so I am bringing some books because that's how I usually start my day is I read and then I feel this like urge to get off the reading page and into the writing page. So I've got like my faves, got Annie Dillard and some Harry Cruz, so David Sedaris. I'm actually bringing Bickham. <laughs> so here's the thing. One thing I've learned from reading Bickham are those scenes and sequels, their relationship to each other, and I'm seeing them more and more. Even in memoir, I'm seeing them more and more, and I'm able to identify them. It's helping me add structure to my work. So I'm going to bring a couple highlighters, and I'm going to go through some of the books that are my favorite, and I'm going to highlight scenes in one color and sequels in another to see how it's being applied. And then I'm going to use that as a prompt for myself, like using this as a model, apply it to a chapter. That kind of structure for me is really helpful. It, you know, I'm not just making stuff up as I go along. I'm basing it off something that's in the wild that I can see and I can structure from. Teachers were very uh, micromanagey. We're control freaks. I think this is where the control freak nature comes in. So what about you, Kim? Are you bringing any books? I might just bring a book for reading. I think it makes sense to bring the Bickham just because I've taken some notes in there and we are words to write by. I bought myself an extra composition book in case I write so much that I get to the end of this composition book. Other than that, I'm going to take my references. I have a couple of key references that I need for my fantasy world that I've been building. So I will make sure I have all my notes and Bibles and things like that to call upon. Yeah, I'm bringing my yellow legal pads. I've grown to really like them. For some weird reason, when I wrote in like closed journal something about them being closed like I don't want to open them or hmm. the things in them have to be special but on a legal notepad it's all notes it doesn't matter and you can flip through them more easily it's a weird mental thing and it's working right now and that might change later right now I'm kind of like enjoying the legal pad so I'll bring a whole full legal pad that's blank and then I'll bring my my computer Yes, and we'll bring some microphones mm -hmm. 
And we'll bring some chargers. And we'll bring and, some candy. And some comfy clothing and my slippers. And a box of wine. That sounds good. <laughs> and some chocolate. <laughs> We're going to gain like 20 pounds on this <laughs> retreat. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to bring my, my robe. I have this, like, luxuriously soft, comfortable robe. Sounds good. And some fuzzy socks, because my feet are always cold. And we each have our own rooms, so we can get away from each other. And it, I think having your own rooms is going to be nice, too. Yeah. You do our own thing. And that's the thing. No Reddit, even at night. Like, I don't even want to be stimulated by the infinite scroll. I don't know if I can pull that off, but I think think you're onto something i used to be very good at turning it off for the past year i have not been partly because because the marketing for the podcast is i'm forced to go into those sites and usually my method is never ever ever and never going on there is easier than only going on there once in a while right i have discovered reddit has some very good answers to questions i have for my background stuff for my book so i often frequent their forums but fortunately i don't actually have as much of a reddit problem as just news scrolling so you mean doom scrolling things aren't doing so good for us uh dear humans (laughs) anyway (laughs) so i think we're ready to go we're ready to go i'm really excited for this and i'm so glad that i have you as a partner to do this with we have been very successful at this podcast we are at the year mark right now because we yep. released starting in October last year mm-hmm. and it has gone so well. I am so happy with it. We have a good partnership. This will be a good retreat. Yes, I, I think we have a very, very good partnership. I love our podcast. I really do. And I love our partnership. And I love that I have a co-host. And I love that this co-host is Kim. She is the perfect co-host, in my opinion. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> And now with that incredible bit of upbeatness, we are going to cut the podcast out. And when we come back, we will be talking about all our success, or maybe not. Yeah, (laughs) success. It will be amazing. No one's going on social media. Okay, see you in a little bit. Bye. So it is 9.23. And we check out at 11 o'clock, so this is about as close to our retreat being done as we can do it without getting out here late. Yep. Let's start with what we accomplished. Uh, okay, so I guess I'll go first. Um, well, I wrote an entire chapter, or I edited an entire chapter so that it's actually like solid, which to me was really hard to do because it was those problematic childhood chapters that I has kind of been very nebulous for me. And I was able to do one, and now I have an example of one that works. So to me, that is is really good. You know, having an example of one that works means you can go back to it and say, yeah, what did I do there? Right. That was a big accomplishment for me, and I'm hoping that that will have exponential returns when I get home. How about you, Kim? Well, I got an entire chapter, one that was almost 6,000 words, written. And when I came here, I really did not know what was in it. I knew just like one sentence summary of what was in it. And I brainstormed it and wrote it out longhand and then typed it up. It took about two days to get from absolutely nothing to having it all written down. And then I got started on chapter eight and I brainstormed that. I wrote it out longhand and I typed up the first thousand or so words. So I've got something to to keep going on when I get back home. I just got a lot of words written. Nice. Do you think you'd have had the same ideas Something thing I realized was how much time I had to spend to get that much written. It was not a single pass from my head to the monitor. It was actually several passes. It was extensive brainstorming notes, one entire pass just written out longhand, and then a second write up of that with edits and modifications as I went along. I'm just not going to be able to write more than 2,000 words, brand new words a day. And I just need to accept that. And to get 2,000 words written, I'm going to need this huge amount of space. So when I get back home, I'm not going to have that. I think my goal of writing 1,000 words or thereabouts a day is probably what I'm capable of. It's good to know what you can do. You have this idea in your head sometimes of how fast or how long it takes to write a draft. But of course, it's going to take longer than you think. But how much longer? 
What's your creative stamina? Like all those things are good to know. Because for me anyway, I've got negative Nancy in my brain and she's really mean. She likes to collect these little fantasies in my head about how much I should be able to do and then what I am capable of doing. And so I think it's good to know where your limits are so then you can plan your schedule accordingly. Did you have any breakthroughs or anything? Um, sequels. I need them. <laughs> Jack Bickham has been really helpful. What's really cool is I just go to the website. So I just have this easy checklist essentially to look back on the notes that we wrote on the website. Um, I am missing some sequels that connect my scenes. And those have been really helpful for me because in memoir, people like to know why you made the decisions that you made, not just what happened, but why. And sequels are helping put that why in there. What I like about the Jack Vickham idea of a sequel is sometimes I'm writing and I realize, oh, I'm getting to someone's head. Oh, this is a sequel. And then suddenly I know, okay, I need to get the emotion out and then I need to get the analysis and thought out. And now I need to move. It's like, oh yeah, I know exactly where to go from the spot now that I recognize that it's a sequel as opposed to before, you know, I would just be sort of writing until I got to my next scene. Totally, totally. So now we're on this retreat and we did it. What decisions did we make that you think were, were good ones? Choosing to go on a retreat with you and Renee was the best decision. <laughs> Aww. I was struck how many times that just knowing you were in the other room writing kept me focused and then knowing that I could just walk over to you and talk. Here's what I think. There is stepping away and there's being pulled away from your writing. And at home, I'm always being pulled away. And not always because from other people with obligations, but even like I'm being pulled away by something I'm reading online or some other thing that I want to be doing. And I can't come back to my writing nearly as easily. Versus here, I was stepping away, having a talk with you, going for a walk, getting some more tea. And I was in the right mindset to keep writing afterwards. Yeah, you were very dedicated. Every time I'd look over, I'd be like, I better get my butt moving. Well, I was sitting upright at a table and you were sitting on a couch. So by, by nature, you, you didn't look like you were working nearly as hard as I did. That's true. I think you were. You were getting a lot of stuff done. Yeah. Did you feel like you were being distracted by stuff? You know, I think it just highlighted the issues for me that go beyond distraction. You know, we're in this space that's different from home and that I don't have the usual distractions. But then I would have thoughts and, and feelings and like fogginess, brain fog a little bit, which makes me realize that that is not necessarily connected to the distractions at home. It's just how my brain is working. That was very illuminating. <laughs> I found it very helpful to have you here because I learned one of my issues is indecision. Um, if you've ever seen The Good Place, there's that one really sexy character. Uh, what's his name? He's the love interest. Cheaty. 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 Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he takes his shirt off. Or and they try to make him look so nerdy, but apparently oh. that's what does it for Renee. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know? So Cheaty, his problem is he's just extremely indecisive. He can never make a choice because there's too many factors and he wants to weigh them all. And that's one of my big problems is I think too much. And I don't know where to go or what to choose. There's so many options. But all of them, none of them feel right. Every time I try to move forward with one, I talk myself out of it. And it's great to have you here because you would sit across from me and we would read like 500 words or something. And you just somehow knew exactly where it needed to go. You're like, you got to go into this or that's a sequel. And I'm like, oh my God, that would fix everything. How come I couldn't think of that on my own? <laughs> I tried to really approach your stuff as never to say, no, don't do that, as much as to say, okay, Renee wants to do this thing, so if she wants to do that thing, what critical next step does she need or what does she need to keep in mind? I didn't want to be a person that sent you on a completely different track. Like, when people tell you to do something differently, I think you, you do. And then someone else tells you to do something else differently. You need to make the decisions yourself. So I was really trying not to make the decisions for you. But your advice was very helpful. It was like kind of a guiding beacon for me to be like, oh, that makes sense. That's what I need. It's you're giving me the reader's perspective, like right away. And it cut all the way through all the indecision. So I'm just, I'm just trying to say, I appreciate you very, very much because that was very helpful. And I will say that the stuff that you read was really good. So oh, it wasn't as hard to tell you what I as a reader wanted. 
it was never what I wanted to read. I think I'll just put this book away for a while and not come back to it. It was never like that. It was good stuff. As far as the basic logistics or the basic setup of the Airbnb and the retreat, any thoughts? You know, this place is awesome. Not only are there different workspaces, but they work on literally different levels. Like I was up a few more steps. I had like this whole area slash space to myself. It wasn't like just a room. It's like a big space with windows. Lots of windows. Lots of windows. And then there's a little hallway, which is still open, but there's a little hallway. And then there's this, what would you call that? Atrium? Atrium. And you're in the atrium, right? And I could go over there. I went over there a couple times, but we were separated into our own spaces where we could work, but we could come together whenever we needed to. And that was really like the perfect setup. And the other thing that was great about this place, the hot tub. Oh yeah. The outdoor shower, which Renee didn't really use, but I loved <laughs> once I figured out how to get it hot. That the main workspace is on the second floor, so you're up looking at all the trees as opposed to the ground. I just could think so well here. The weather was perfect. I ran every day and there were hills and I'm always trying to get more hills in my life. I got to run in the woods. I got to come back. I got to ride. It was a really good idea. So I did forget my teapot that I use and I, I should have brought some lotion for my face. I mean, there are like little things like that. And I think next time I'll just have my list and really be careful going through it. I was really glad I remembered my slippers. I was jealous of your slippers. I should have brought slippers. It was also nice because we both had stuff. Like Renee brought a whole bunch of mineral waters. And at a certain point, I ran out of mineral water. So I was very glad to have Renee's mineral waters. So next retreat. Any thoughts about that or what you might do differently or anything? I would probably have less snacks because sitting there trying to think like your mind wanders. And then, at least for me, I ate like second breakfast. So maybe a few less things to be indulgent about. Yeah, like I ate too much. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to step on the scale. It was tasty and fun, but it was just too easy to eat that second yogurt. I think I might go through down the list of stuff that I brought and then just kind of limit myself just so I don't have the whole plethora of a table to get through, but just a few smaller things. This retreat was still me writing a first draft. And maybe the next time I do a little getaway, I'll still be working on a first draft or on like the initial opening sections, but I'm hoping to do a retreat at some point where I'm analyzing it and just coming up with how to proceed to the second draft. That'll be a very different experience because I won't be writing. I will be reading and taking notes and trying to synergize as opposed to just looking at a small chapter and saying, this is how I'm going to write this chapter. That's kind of the space I'm in right now where a lot of the stuff is written is just very disorganized and a lot needs to be written to connect it all. So that's kind of my space. It feels very odd. It's a weird process. Do you think the number of days we chose was the right amount? I think that was perfect time. I was running out of steam yesterday, but I pushed through another day of this. I don't know. Maybe I would just get used to it, but I'm tired. Mm, yeah. I'm glad to be going home, but I'm worried that I will lose momentum because this place really makes you gain a momentum. Yeah. We've decided to try to do some full days of writing coming up in the next couple of weeks to see if we can't keep this momentum going. Yeah, as a result, we realized that, you know, like B Bradbury, man, spending a whole six hours, whole day writing is like really great if you can do it. And it's, and it's cumulative too. Like the next day, you just have more to work on or more to build on. Exactly. And so we've discussed it and we've scheduled for the next two weeks, two days, where we're both going to go and work for six hours like we did in that episode during Bradbury's season. So yeah. using the things we figured out went wrong last time. So all the better. Anyway. Exactly. And so I, I think um, time to get final last bits of scribbling writing down and we'll head on out. We actually took some other little voice memo notes while we were here and we will be stringing them together for a bonus podcast. Usually our bonus podcasts we put into our Patreon account for people, but I think we're just going to release the set of experiences we had on the retreat as a bonus podcast for all our listeners next week. And if you enjoy the little bonus podcast and you want to hear more like that, there are more on our Patreon account. Our Patreon account is a way that you can support us in this podcast. We don't make any money off of it. And it takes a fair amount of time away from writing at times, but is totally worthwhile because we would never have done this retreat without it. Um, what other ways can they support us, Renee? You can go to our website, 
and uh, read our awesome show notes. We go the extra mile. You can come to our talk on November 10th for the National Women's Book Association where we talk about podcasting. You can write a review on Apple Podcasts. Okay. You could share this podcast with your writer friends. We, we, you know, we put a lot of work into these episodes and they really are, I think, pretty valuable resources for writers. So please share. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for listening and we will have something up for you next week as well. Exactly. Bye-bye. Bye. Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim smith Adam. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. Oh, you've got a cat sitting in front of your mic, too. I've got a cat, too. Mine is right next to me right now. He's sitting on my computer.